introduce you to these amazing artists that we have as our guests today. And uh, I just want to do a quick introduction of them and then bring them up onto the stage to have a conversation. Um, and uh, so our first artist that um, is here is Leah Lakshmi Pisna Samarsina. And she is a queer, disabled femme writer, award-winning, um, performance artist and educator who identifies as Burger Tamil Sri Lankan and uh, also of Irish and Roma ascent. Um, and if, uh, in, our, in your program today, you do have their full bios, but I do want to highlight a couple uh, things about each of the artists. Um, she's probably most well known for some of her work as co-founder of Mangoes with Chile, North America's touring queer and trans people of color cabaret, which um, has done amazing work. Uh, and then also for the Disability Justice Incubator Sins and Valid. Um, and uh, she has done, uh, she's been um, published in many, many works, and please refer to the bios and also um, websites. Um, and she's gonna be reading for us today as well. Um, Kathy Jeepner, uh, Kitchener is a Marshallese writer. She lives and works on the Marshall Islands and where she teaches specific studies courses at the College of the Marshall Islands. And she's also co-director of the youth environmental nonprofit Joe Jikum. And uh, she, her work really highlights traumas of col colonialism, racism, forced migration, um, and a lot of the challenges that the Marshallese have faced. Um, and she was also featured as a, uh, sh she performed a piece at the United Nations Climate Summit, um, a piece that she had written for her daughter. And, um, there's a very powerful video of her doing that piece online, so please, I hope you would check that out. So if I could bring them both to the stage, and we'll begin our conversation. Special connection, and uh, Kathy, you told me that you have um, uh, that you have a history together. So maybe, um, do you want to start with that? Oh, oh, uh, yeah, sure. So I was born in the Marshall Islands uh, and moved to Hawaii when I was about six years old. So I was raised in Hawaii out there for about 14 years before moving to uh, California to attend Mills College. And at Mills College, while I was in Mills College, I became involved in a poetry program called Poetry for the People at UC Berkeley. And um, you just kind of attend as a student. And it's what kind of, it's an amazing program because it's the first time where I, I read just entirely poets of color and then saw how each poet engaged with their community and with social justice issues and how poetry could be a vehicle not just for self-expression but for change. And it was during my time at Poetry for the People that I met Rhea. And yeah. And um, it, was where, it was there that we both became student teacher poets. Uh, after that, I returned to the Marshall Islands, worked at the college for a while, went back to my master's, and then uh, came out to the Marshalls and began teaching. And then the UN happened, and that was kind of crazy. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you kind of blow up from there. Yeah. Um, yes, and maybe Leah, you can talk a little bit more about that program, because I mean, it just sounds incredible. Yeah, totally. Um, this is actually the first time I've seen Kathy in four years, because diaspora is like that. Um, you know, where I was like, yeah, no, we were like having brunch together, and I was probably hungover, and then, you know, now here we are. It's amazing. Um, wait, sorry, I have kind of an uplifting sometimes that comes out. Um, 
No, I mean, so the, some things to know about Poetry for the People was that it actually was founded by um, the amazing, amazing, amazing um, Afro-Caribbean queer feminist poet Jim Jordan. And, um, you know, if people don't know her, you should totally look her up. She wrote something like 33 books. She's an incredible black scholar and activist and organizer. And always was a poet at the center of it all. And I know that um, in studying her work with poetry for people, um, there's a book that she and some of the first folks who were involved with it wrote called Poetry for the People, a Revolutionary Blueprint. And I always remember two things that she said in that book. One, that she was like, yeah, all my life as a teacher, I have tried to remember exactly how much I hated school as a kid and why. And, and she wasn't kidding, she was just like, yeah, you know, I was like a black student growing up in, in New York in the 50s and 60s, and being surrounded by like, you know, curriculum that so many of us still face, where, you know, the Dead Poets Society is a real thing, where poetry just seems to be like old white dead guys, that's it. She was like, no, like there's this other people's poetry, there's black poetry, there's brown poetry, there's women's poetry, there's queer poetry, there's all of this stuff. And that leads me to the second thing I always remember her saying, which is like, you can't, the reason why politi poetry is political is that you can't write lies and tell good poetry. Where she was like, it's a means, she's like, when people ask me what poetry is, it's a means of telling the truth. Because she's like, if you try to write a poem and you mess around or you try to make it neat or pretty or convenient, it's just gonna be bad, you know? And that's why it's political, and that's why so many artists of color have turned to poetry and spoken word because it's a way that we can tell our truths when they've been repressed. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. yeah, I would add that I really like poetry for the people because it not just taught us about the social justice movements that inspires the writing of these poets, you know, you learn about each community that you, you read, but it also encouraged us to, to just hone our craft to just be as good of a writer as you are, a, a community organizer, a scholar, you know, and it pushed us as poets. So, yeah. so um, were you poets first, organizers first, or tell us a little bit, maybe um, kind of go back in history before the program, um, because that sounds like a pretty big lynch point, both your kind of careers, but what led you to even that point? Maybe, um, Leah, you want to yeah, I mean, I was a nerd first. Like, I was, I mean, nerds. you know, I mean, I... How many nerds in the audience? Yes, yes yeah, thank you. Yeah. I mean, my generation, so um, I grew up in the Rust Belt in the Northeast. I grew up in a city called Western Massachusetts. It's a very blue-collar city um, with a lot of mills that were closing down. And my father, and it's very, you know, it's working class, white, ethnic, black, Puerto Rican, Southeast Asian. But it was the 80s, like I was born in 1975, and me and my dad were really of that generation. We were the two Sri Lankans we knew of in Worcester, Massachusetts. And, um, you know, as I was talking about with some folks over there, we were like, oh yeah, the 80s when Reagan was in power, we all thought we were gonna die. And, you know, um, and for me, like, I just, I really, like, got saved by going to the library, you know, and my parents were very much, like, immigrant and working class, you're gonna go to college, you know, and my mom was like, you're gonna have health insurance, and when I was like, cool, I made it to college, I want to be a writer, she was like, you know, and I was like, okay, sorry, I'm sorry, I know you wanted to, you know, she wanted me to be a plant geneticist because it was stable, I don't know when she came up with that, but, you know, here we are, and we have Obamacare, so I'm like, I have insurance, mom, nah, it's cool. Um, but, I mean, my mom was very much like a working class feminist and was very much like, also, you know, like shout outs to all the people with like white moms that were not always the greatest because there's great white moms, there's also white moms who have, you know, done a lot of racist stuff to us as brown kids. So that was also my experience. Um, but with books, I, you know, one of the things I really valued with my mom was the degree to which she was like, you can find your way out through story. And which my dad also would just like tell me all the stories about Sri Lanka and our really far flung immigrant family. And um, through that, I like nerded out and I found like feminist of color poetry at 12, which really didn't make me popular, which I already wasn't, so that was fun. But, um, you know, I mean, I remember um, just really like reading all these women of color writing and being like, you can tell these truths about your life and not die and not be killed, that's really powerful. Because, I mean, for me, like I think so many of us, we grew up in communities where there was a lot of racism, sexism, homophobia, and also families that were really under the microscope. So it was like, you don't talk about your real stuff to anybody, you're gonna get in trouble. 
And so for me, like writing was just a way where I was like at first in secret, and then more publicly, I was like, I want to write to tell those stories to get something back. Well, maybe that's a good segue for you to read. No, 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 not yet. Not yet. Okay. All right. So well. Nice try. This is a conversation. See, this is very uh, so, Kathy. Maybe, what is your story? What were you a nerd? How did you kind of start yeah. writing nerd. as a way to express? Yes, yes, life yes. So, I think for me, um, I had kind of a different experience where we were first immigrants, uh, first generation immigrants to the from the Marshall Islands to Hawaii. But I still that similar kind of like tone of be successful, become a lawyer, you're gonna go to, you know, Ivy League school. I didn't go to the Ivy League school, but I did go to Mills College, and I ended up wanting to study writing. And I know that when I did the, I started studying spoken word in college, I remember at one point, my mother went to my first, like, you know, slam poetry show, and she was kind of like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> she kind of left me like, Kathy's doing this thing that I don't really understand. And she kind of still feels that way a little bit. But for the most part, I, the thing is with Pacific Islander writers is that there's such a gap, you know, like at the time, I didn't know that there were Islander writers. And then one day I came across a copy of something called the Nua Nua. Nua Nua is a collection of writing that Albert Wendt, a Samoan writer, uh, put together. And it just blew my mind. I was like, oh my god, Islanders can write. Islanders can tell stories. And for me, what always drove me to become a writer is the fact that I never saw myself, I never saw any of my stories in print in anywhere at all. Like, not in media, not in stories, nothing. And so, I, I mean, even the book that I'm about to come out with is about to be the first published Marshallese collection of writing outside of the Marshalls. And <laughs> But yeah, so that's why, because like to me, it was always very important that I publish a book of writing because of the fact that there's none out there. And so just like Leah, I kind of had to do the same thing. I was writing in secret at first, and then it just drove me to keep telling these different kinds of stories that I just didn't see anywhere else. Yeah, we, I was part of a panel earlier today um, called White Washed Out. We were talking about representations of APIs in arts and media. and. Um, we were reminded of uh, Alan Yang, who was one of the writers of Master of None, who won an Emmy. Um, he made his, uh, his acceptance speech talking about, you know, give your kids a camera, you know, because it, and it's interesting to hear you talk about sort of having to be secretive about it, but um, I think, hope, you know, I would like to think that we're in a newer generation of youth and um, artistry and creativity and using that voice. So, so with that, maybe, Leah, are you ready to share? Yes, I am ready. I want to say just like one thing back to Kathy first. Oh, yeah, sure. Share again, you know? Please. No, I mean, I just really appreciate what you said about like, you know, what, I mean, it's still hard to be like the first, that's a lot of pressure, but just the importance of being like, wow, there's literally no writing in print by a Marshallese poet, you know, by a Marshallese woman poet. And um, just in terms of what you were saying about the importance of creativity, I mean, I think, things are opening up, but I think that even when I think back to like the 90s, you know, as a Sri Lankan, I mean, so many, of, so much of our story of immigration is having to flee our island because of the civil war and being refugees and all kinds of stuff, which many people have migrant and refugee experiences that are similar. And, you know, stories are what travel, you know, they really are. And when I think, I mean, I kind of dodged your question about like, were you an activist or a poet first or whatever, and like, I've been both, but, um, for me, I mean, there's a lot of traditional organizing that honestly, after a while, I was like, I'm better as a cultural worker, and that's my work, that's some of my organizing work. And, you know, as a student, kind of like, what I think of is like in the 90s, where like, I feel like in North America, queer and trans people of color organizing was just really starting to take off in certain ways. Um, and where, you know, I think, you know, like 1.5 were second generation foundations were just finding each other you know, as people, as queers, as organizers. When I think of like one of the first places I found Sri Lankan community, it was through books. Like it was through writers like Sham Savardarai, Yasmin Hamaya. Um, and those were people who in the community, they were writing about the Civil War, they were writing about the Kadamo, they were writing about being queer. And I remember my dad, you know, just being like, have you seen this book? You know, and being like, this is back home. And because of the war, we couldn't go back. And those were writers who were really able to talk about like race and class and sexuality and gender and like politics through storytelling. 
because, you know, I mean, I don't know, like, as Sri Lankans, we like to talk about politics, we like to be traumatized, we like to just like, rah, 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 right? Like, you know. Um, but there's also a lot of trauma about, and a lot of secrets, because it's a small island, and everybody knows your business really easily, as I'm sure some folks in here can totally relate to. I'm, I'm sure nobody can relate to it, actually. It's really weird. Um, but you know, like, you read about something that's fiction, and you're like, oh, this is something where I can see myself, this is something where I can see this story of whether it's somebody coming out as queer, or having to flee the island, or dealing with politics, or dealing with, you know, being married as a woman when you don't want to be, and you're trying to negotiate sexuality and independence, like, that's a tool, you know, and it was writers like that that really made me feel like this is a specific way as Asian and Pacific Islander poets and writers you know, this is our work, and it's been there in our communities for a long time, that storytellers have been the people who, like, talk out the hard stuff. You know, and get to be a little wild and get to say the things that, you know, maybe there's a struggle to feel like there's room to say. Yeah. So, okay, I will read a poem. Um, so we both have airport poems, actually, and um, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like as, like, an ambiguous brown could be Muslim person, like, there's been this kind of, like, you know, what, they have like the orange and the red alerts and stuff in the airport, but like people who could be Muslim or were profiled for different ways were always like, how tense is it in the airport today? Like we have our own kind of rating system. And um, I've written a lot of pieces um, since 9-11 and also before about just kind of tracking what Islamophobic profiling has done to us in terms of safety and travel and trauma. So um, this is airport ode number one. The truth is, I ask for the opt-out. I ask for it every single time. I would so much rather be patted down by a 60-ish white working class woman who looks exactly like my mom, who I will studiously yes ma'am and ask about her day to be safe, than to sit in that line sweating, waiting for it to happen. Than to have that beam of arrow Adam shot through my body and still get barked aside, patted down, tarot cards and coconut oil wanded. This is true, they were like, what's this? There was like coconut oil. They were like, it's not hard enough, it's gonna be hard. And I was like, wow, I didn't know coconut oil had to be hard. Okay. <laughs> Once on my way to a red eye from a performance in a cocktail dress, you were young and brown and queer at TSA, and you said, damn, it'll be easy to search you, you're hardly wearing anything at all. You complimented my Mokuti, and because I am a frequent queer brown lady flyer, you remembered me from a week or two ago, and this is where we are. I chat friendly and deliberate with the woman who could be my sister who searches me. Legs spread one in front of the other, back of the hand on sensitive areas, here's the fur line, your bra, you've done this before? Yes. Casual spread eagle in public, as everyone hops on shoes, puts their laptops back, acts like it's normal. Not too long ago, every airport line a panic attack. Every airport four hours sweating armpit rain. Aunties who tell you to get there six hours early and be polite. Every bus crossing being pulled aside to the small room and guards who don't even pretend to be polite, who go all through all your things and take you out to the back. Now, every time they chirp, I'm gonna pat your hair, I go deep inside and all the way out. Once, my girlfriend picked me up from the airport with a little Tupperware of dinner and fed it to me in the back seat of her car. I was too nervous to say thank you, but I loved how she wanted to feed me, how she wanted to take me back in the middle of all these concrete cameras, wands, scanners, fingerprints, nexus, red looking eye, this place that hates us. Um, before you leave here, maybe we could just talk a little bit about that. I mean, I think um, there's so many places, I will, uh, there's so many questions to ask because you both have brought up so many amazing, interesting points. Um, but I think one of the things that strikes me uh, about listening to your poem is, uh, and I think both of you can talk about this, is, you know, even within the API community, I think there are experiences that your communities have, are, have that maybe are not ever as represented within the API community. Can you talk a little bit about being underrepresented in an underrepresented <laughs> community um, and how you know your work reflects that? Can I go? I can go anywhere. Sure. No, no, no. Oh, I thought you should go. 
Well, we're going to talk about We're going to talk about her tonight, so. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to say. I mean, I feel lucky because, like, after growing up in Worcester, which is, like, very QC, not that South Asian, um, I moved to Toronto, which is, is incredibly diverse, majority of people of color, 10% South Asian, many, many different communities of South Asians, and it's the world's biggest global stream of diaspora community. You know, with like a huge amount of like pan, indigenous, and people of color organizing, activism, and art and culture, and you know, free healthcare also. So it was good. Um, really shitty winters. Um, so, I mean, I didn't feel underrepresented, and I still don't when I'm in Toronto um, because the community, that's the baseline for the community, and we have different ways of talking about stuff. I think that as people, you know, Canada has a specific kind of First Nations organizing, so. It really has felt, and it's not utopia, but it's felt like you have all these First Nations folks and all these folks who were poor people of color from like immigrant or refugee communities. So everyone really had this like kind of common understanding that we're all people who survived colonization and that we're fighting, right? Which is different than in a lot of US contexts, um, but that's been really powerful. Um, and you know, South Asia is an ever changing place in terms of diaspora. Like, I feel like in the 90s, in that community, everybody was kind of like working class, you know, just trying to like, you know, get everything together with family. And now there's a lot more class divides that have really illuminated colorism and caste, right? So, um, you know, and I think that that's the thing, is like it's really about what choices, because, you know, like I co-founded an organization over 10 years ago in Toronto called Asian Arts Freedom School, um, which is a pro project for young APA folks. We defined young as up to 30 because we were like, okay, yeah, like maybe you have to sneak out to go to poetry class, it's fine. Um, and one of our students, um, Kenji Tamako, um, made this amazing silk screen of just the whole continent of Asia that said Asia is the biggest continent. And we were very pan Asian, but we're like, yeah, Asia is like Palestinian. It's like you can be Indo Caribbean, you can be Sri Lankan, you can be Filipino. That's a lot of diversity within Asia of experience, right? And that's our strength. And also, we don't all necessarily face the same struggles or know each other's histories. So there's like really conscious work that has to go on to be like, okay, how are we all together in this? What I'm saying is, like, um, in that context, like, you know, there's, I feel like there's less solidarity in an easier way. It's different than in the 90s where everyone was like South Asian and kind of broke together. And now it's like, okay. Are you somebody who is maybe making a lot of money in tech or like in terms of Sri Lankans? I kind of joke that we're some of like the bad South Asians because you know we're we're darker skinned, a lot of us. We're from a country that's faced a lot of civil war. And um, recently, I don't know if folks saw a lot of the Asians for Black Lives Matter organizing efforts that are happening, which are really amazing and you should check out. Um, there's one letter that was kind of like, Dear parents, we know you don't know any black people and you've never been profiled, but you know, we care. And I was like, that's legit for some communities. There is a Tamil gang unit that, uh, in the Toronto Police Department that has done, a, because there were a lot of Tamil young folks that were involved in gangs, were also, you know, shipping guns back home and stuff. So I think that there's different experiences we can talk about, and a lot of it is about class and about tensions that have been within the big part of Asia for a while. You know, I don't think they have to be divisions that keep us forever, but I think we have to be real about them. I just think oh, that well, yeah, I think maybe you can respond to this too. It's like, in a way, the further we go in the movement, the, the, in some ways you kind of have to divide up more, or there's a more nuance to the discussion as opposed to, oh, we're all together, you know, oh, well, you know, your struggle is a lot different than my struggle, and um, let's talk about it, it's not easy, you know? So, maybe, Kathy, can you talk about that? Well, I know that as an islander, I've never liked the API terminology, just because so many times API groups Asians and Pacific Islanders together, and then the needs of Pacific Islanders ends up falling through because so much of our culture is actually different, the history is actually different too. And so when we have API student, you know, centers or API student, like, groups, a lot of times I've, I've always felt as a PI that I was overshadowed or underrepresented, actually. So it's interesting because I've been living in the Marshall Islands for two years now, and you know, I'm coming out here to Oregon and I'm remembering again the whole needing to have people of color spaces and needing to, because you know, it's just Marshallese people everywhere. You're never going around being like, let's form a Marshallese group with a Marshall Islands. You know? <laughs> that has just never been a thing. So coming out here again, I'm like, oh yeah, this is something so important actually, you know? And I was actually talking to Leah, I remember about uh, this morning, I mean this morning about poetry for the people and it was interesting because 
We also were performing at the API Summit, I think yeah, it's the Asian, called, yeah, Asian so Pacific Islander Summit. Spoken Summit. Word Summit. Yeah, at, yeah. Um, at UC Berkeley. And the thing was, like, I grew up in Hawaii, so there was Islanders everywhere, there was Asians everywhere, but being in um, Berkeley and being in California was the first time where I was like, where are the Islanders? I was like, where are you guys? You know, like, I remember seeing some uh, Tongan kid on a bus strumming a ukulele, and I just stared at it and almost started crying and wanting to hug this poor kid. And of course, he was holding it out because he was like, who the heck is this person? But you know, like that's how much I craved an Islander presence, you know. And also, as a first, like, one of, I think I might have been one of the first Pacific Islander student teacher poets in the Poetry for the People program, I became uh, like in charge of putting together a Pacific, the first Pacific Islander section, which was a lot for me, you know, at the time because I realized, wow, I. That was the first time where I was like, I don't know enough Pacific Islander literature. And that's kind of what drew me to go back to the to, uh, University of Hawaii, get my master's in Pacific Island studies, return home, begin to learn so much more about Islander cultures. And so for me, it's always been really important to be to find spaces where Islanders are represented. But this isn't, again, you know, I think I agree with what you're saying. You know, it shouldn't be all about being di dis divisive at all, you know, but it is understanding that in certain ways, putting the groups together can be very useful to our common causes, but then also understanding that representation from these different groups and understanding each other's history and creating those dialogues and spaces and making sure that representation is so important. Yeah. yeah. And having also the spaces even for your own group to talk about. So can we hear um, you yeah, three steps? <laughs> that I want to speak on is it's a very different airport type of poem because um, you know talking about this whole divisiveness within groups well actually you know amongst islanders of course you know we all know even in, within our communities there's racial biases you know we're everywhere and um, with amongst Pacific islanders especially in Hawaii right now uh, Micronesians the, the group of islands that my islands are from so as you know there's Micronesia, Polynesia, Melanesia so um, there's an influx right now of people from the Micronesian area, Federated States of Micronesia especially, and Marshall Islands, coming into Hawaii and um, you know, accessing healthcare benefits because of many reasons, colonization ruining our islands, nuclear testing ruining our islands. So we're coming into the Hawaii and we're using these healthcare benefits and unfortunately, um, quite a few, we've become targets for Hawaii legislatures to become, you know, we're the scapegoats right now. And so I grew up, my experience growing up in Hawaii, interestingly enough, even though I was among so many islanders, was actually a lot of racism against Micronesians. You know, I was, be, I was taught a lot to be ashamed of being Micronesian. Um, and that's the kind of tension that I kind of address in my poem. So yeah, let me just read it. So it's called The Monkey Gate. One, my uncle tells the story of being lost in the Honolulu airport, how he fished out a wandering airport employee and asked him if he knew where the Micronesian gate was. The man smirked through blue uniform. You mean the monkey gate? Blood rushing beneath his face, blank and unchanged, my uncle turned and jogged in the direction the man had pointed. Part two, alarms sound off. Three o'clock in the morning, our bodies buzz from cramped beds, pull-up couches, and flowery futons. We rise, shove swap meat t-shirts, frozen steak, macadamia chocolates, and extra cases of our lives into solid, trustworthy coolers. Snap shut and bound with luminescent strands of tape, we pack everything into battered minivans and bucking SUVs. And as we sail along blank roads, we watch the landscape of apartment complexes that loom above dozy bars, broken 7-Elevens, and mini marts. What did you let it then? Wake her up. Our eyes flicker open to muttering cousins. The harsh lights of the Honolulu airport flood through the milky translucence of the window. As we drain our belongings from slide and shut doors, we chatter away nerves, rumbling and rolling in our bellies. At the check-in gates, Kostrian cousins argue over coolers that weigh too much. A Pompeian suit urgently checks his watch while bony kneed brown children run leak across carts and piles of suitcases, coolers, boxes, guarded by grain, chookies, and Marshallese women. Whole families crouch and recline on the linoleum floor. We slide our slippers off. We make ourselves comfortable, prop up ashy feet. The line to check-in is long, and bag check even longer. 
saying goodbye or one-arm hugs and tears sweating slow off our skin and we are sad to see each other leave and we are happy to see each other leave. We wave to the airport employees. We thank them for handing us our tickets and carrying on us. And with upright backs, we smile, stroll past security. Thank you. Um, it's so neat to hear, but these are both about your airport <laughs> poems, but uh, very different uh, styles and content. Um, I want to talk a little bit, so um, at Apano, we, this morning we talked about, uh, we have a new strategic plan for the organization, and one of the areas we're really focusing on is uh, cultural work. And I would love to hear, um, and we've talked a little bit about it, so I want to kind of go back to this. And you know, you're both organizers as well, and um, how you're using cultural work, how you're using art to forward, uh, move forward the, the the social justice issues that you're really working on right now. Um, you got to go with stuff. Okay, Kathy. You well, on. actually, it's kind of interesting. I was going to ask the cultural work is earlier. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's what I do. That's good to know. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I think we, I think there's maybe not really um, only one definition of culture work, because I think other, uh, another way to think about cultural work is also cultural and sort of uh, just the community of cultural work. But I think in this context, we can talk about it as art okay. and creativity. Yeah. So um, I think for me, uh, my work has been focused on a lot, in a lot of different areas, but lately it's been um, mostly climate change. And this happened after college with Leah and um, I returned to the Marshall Islands and climate change was something I heard about when I was at UC Berkeley and I was like, oh, climate change, this is whatever, that's not real. And then I go back home to the Marshall Islands and you know, if you don't know where it is, you should Google it. It's just, the ocean out there is enormous. Like there's some areas of the, that are, some islands that are this big, it's as big as this room. And then there are also, or smaller. And then there's also some parts of the island where it's so thin you can see ocean on either side of you. And so it was the first time that I really began to confront the vulnerability of our island. So when I began to do research into uh, climate change and how journalists were discussing the issue of climate change, it always seemed like this existential threat that would never really happen, that was about to happen and that was definitely going to happen and that Martianist people and other islanders who are uh, from Atoll nations would definitely have to move. And this was something that I was like, what? What type of, how can you say that we have to leave? Like, how can you expect us to leave our homeland, you know, our islands that have been there for thousands of years and been a part of our culture? And so that's kind of when I began to realize that I needed to write about this and the way that's how I process the world around me. And so um, I, I figured, okay, I wrote a poem that just came out in one sitting one day when we went to go to sing to my Auntie Mary uh, for her birthday, she has Alzheimer's, and um, it was a room full of women, you know, my aunties, my cousins, my mother, and it was just so beautiful, our singing to this one woman who didn't even recognize us, but we all came together just for her birthday. And there were so many of us, and I thought, man, this is so beautiful. This is what I would want people to know about my home, that this is what is at stake if people don't change the way they're you know, operating right now. And so, yeah, that one, one night it just all came out um, in a poem called Tell Them. And that's where I've been using a lot of my poetry and spoken word is such an accessible art form. And YouTube has been so like generous for me because suddenly people are hearing this Marshallese poet out of nowhere, you know, not published at all, like not at all, you know, um, scholarly or anything, but I'm sharing this story that nobody has heard yet. And so that's kind of where art has been important to me, is that it's, again, I guess it's just sharing my story that I didn't see anywhere else. I know you already read a poem. Would you want to read, tell them? I don't know. You, you can. <laughs> you can <laughs> it's such a powerful piece. Four years. <laughs> yes. yes. I think it would be awesome to hear, because I think it's so fitting for today and this work. So this poem, yeah, actually, it was interesting. I always talk about how it's inspired by my islands, but it's also inspired by my friends in the Bay, because I was thinking about sending a package to them 
and what I would want them to know. So it's like an interesting dialogue between these two worlds for me. So anyways, this is a poem that um, I wrote kind of to the Bay, but also to, of course, for the Marshall Islands. And it's really in regards to um, answering that question that a lot of journalists have, you know, have made the assumption that we're just going to pick up and leave. And so I wanted to make sure, make that assertion that, you know, we shouldn't have to leave, that there is plenty of time to save my islands and, of course, save the world. Um, so this is a poem where I, uh, I wrote for that. I prepared the package for my friends in the States. First, the dangling earrings, woven into half moons, black pearls glinting like an eye in a storm of tight spirals. Second, the baskets, sturdy, also woven, brown, cowrie, shell shiny, intricate mandala shaped by calloused fingers. Inside the basket, I write a message. Wear these earrings to parties, to classes and meetings, to the corner store, the grocery store, and while riding the bus. Store jewelry, incense, copper coins, and curling letters like this one, in this basket. And when others ask you where you got this, you tell them they're from the Marshall Islands. Show them where it is on a map. Tell them we are a proud people toasted dark brown as the carved ribs of a tree stump. Tell them we are descendants of the finest navigators in the world. Tell them our islands were dropped from a basket carried by a giant. Tell them we are the hollow hulls of canoes as fast as the wind slicing through the Pacific Sea. We are wood shavings and drying pandanus leaves and sickly widows at gamins. Tell them we are the sweet harmonies of mothers, aunties, sisters, songs late into night. Tell them we are whispered prayers, the breath of God, a crown of fuchsia flowers, encircling anti mirrors, white sea foam hair. Tell them we are styrofoam cups of Kool-Aid red, waiting patiently for the don't. We are papaya golden sunsets, bleeding into a glittering open sea. Tell them we are dusty rubber slippers, sweat from concrete doorsteps. We're the ripped seams and broken door handles of taxis. We're sweaty hand shaking another sweaty hand in heat. Tell them we're days and nights hotter than anything you can imagine. Tell them we're little girls with braids, carpeting beneath the rain. We're shards of broken beer bottles burrowed beneath fine white sand. We're children fleeing like rubber bands across the road, clogged with chugging cars. Tell them we only got one road. <laughs> and after all this, you tell them about the water. How we have seen it rising, flooding across our cemeteries, gushing over our sea walls, and crashing against our homes. Tell them what it's like to see the entire ocean level with the land. Tell them we are afraid. Tell them we don't know of the politics or the science, but we see what's in our own backyard. Tell them some of us are old fishermen who believe that God made us the promise. Tell them some of us are a little bit more skeptical. But most importantly, you tell them that we don't want to leave, that we've never wanted to leave, and that we are nothing without our islands. Thank you. different um, social justice issues. You work a lot in the disability community and in the queer community. Can you talk a little bit about how your work works uh, in your social justice activism? Yeah, totally. Um, so I co-founded with Cherry Gillette, um, my friend Cherry Gillette, um, in 2005, this organization called Mangos with Chili. And um, we, I don't know, we just met online and we were like, yeah, let's have a national tour of queer and trans people color performance art. Sure, no problem. And like, <laughs> you know, I rented a minivan that seated six for a seven person tour because I was going to go with the credit card. You know, all kinds of things happened. Um, and we ended up doing that for 10 years and toured North America five times, um, did lots of performances in the Bay Area and different cities. And a lot of when we were talking to people about why it was important to have something that was like all queer and trans, black and brown folks, was like we, I don't know who came up with it, but we started um, using the phrase, we're writing ourselves into history, you know? And I really still believe that. And you know, so much has changed in the last decade, but when we started, 
it really felt like there was, you know, queer scenes that were like mostly white people, and then there were like black and brown poetry scenes that were great, but you know, often you felt like you were really putting yourself out there to be out in queer or trans. And you know, there was homophobia and there was mis homophobia and transphobia. And for us, you know, when I think about like what's my answer to why is cultural work important, I was like, yeah, it was you know, when we would be in like Tucson or like little towns in the middle of nowhere or like the queer bar and we'd be performing to queer black and brown audiences and people would just be crying and being like, this is like church and this is like, I'm seeing stories in my life that I've never seen on stage before. You know, I'm seeing what it's like to be queer and Mexican or trans and Filipino or like all the other stuff. And that was through writing, that was through dance, that was through circus arts. Because we got really, we're like, okay, we're gonna hang this trapeze from <laughs> stuff, you know? And um, I think that's why it's important. And I think, like, in, you know, with Mangos Chile and with Sins and Valid, which is the performance organization that I'm a part of that does a lot of disability justice work, we're all disabled and chronically ill, um, you know, queer and or people of color. And um, a lot of times I think, like, you know, as oppressed people, there's so many places where we don't control the world, we don't control what's gonna happen in the schools or on the streets or stuff like that. But with performance, you can kind of create this temporary world for two hours where you're like, this is what it's gonna be, you know? And this is where I'm gonna tell the truth about stuff and it's gonna be like that. And, um, you know, um, Simpson Ballard's co-founder, Patty Byrne, is Japanese and Haitian, physically disabled, queer woman of color, 51, incredible director. And you know she's been involved in social justice organizing for years and years and years. And there was one time where I was like, so why don't you do workshops? And she's like, well, I do. But she's like, you know, she's like, mostly she's like, I got sick of trying to convince able-bodied people of color to care about disability. So I could do a workshop or I could do a three minute piece of performance art that just messes with their head and gets into all of their dreams and nightmares and makes them go, oh shit, sorry. Um, and <laughs> I'm really holding back the swearing, I have a potty mouth, so okay, I hope that's, that's okay for now. And she's like, you know, there's so many ways in which art works, you know, in the space of dreams and the irrational and the stuff that we know is true, you hear it and you're like, oh God, it's so real, that you could get out of a 600 page theory book, but you could also just get it through a poem. So that's what I think a lot. Can you talk a little bit more about the challenge of being an artist in social justice movements? Because um, you started touching on that as sort of like people don't necessarily take you seriously, or um, I don't know. Yeah. Do you have more to say? I, don't, I think it's a lot better than it used to be, to be honest. Like, I don't know. Like, I feel like when I was starting out, I remember going to this like organizing meeting to free Mumia Abu Jamal, who's an African American political prisoner in the States. And there were some really like old white communist guys there, you know, like a lot of them. And like, we were these like young people of color, and, like, yeah, we're gonna like bring hip hop in and we're gonna have a performance and we're gonna do all this stuff. And this one guy was like, that's not how you organize politically jumping around on a stage. You sell the paper. And like then he has this like Bolshevik tendency paper that you know, he's like, do you want this? And I was like, no, I don't want your paper. Like it's just it's not it's not exciting to me. Um, I think there used to be like in the 90s, I feel like there's a lot more kind of denigration of cultural work and I feel like now, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how those folks were younger than me, but I feel like I do see a big shift in terms of people being like, you know, if there's not art and culture and poetry and the images of like the new world we want and of what we're going through, we're not going to be able to do this. You know, so, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to actually add, add to that a little bit because um, I think it's a little bit different for me because after I did my poem at the United Nations Climate Summit, it kind of launched me into a lot of climate change organizing with folks from like representing the United Nations and World Bank and all these crazy, you know, conversations and, and conferences that I suddenly attended. And unfortunately, in a lot of these places, it was completely white dominated spaces. And so a lot of times I was brought in as like the poet, the UN poet, the indigenous voice, the brown person, you know, and, and the islander, you know, and it's just a lot of times I was being tokenized. I was like, why aren't you wearing your mat today? You know, why aren't you wearing your cultural clothes today? Or like, and then there was also spade times when I was taught, I was treated like, um, like, okay, you, you perform at home and then you sit and don't say anything. Like, that's it. We don't really need to hear any more from you. 
And so in my case, like I feel like I'm entering this space that's so like, especially I think in, even in environmental movements, is very white dominated. And yet indigenous people are the ones who have always been saying save Mother Earth from like day one. And right. it's only now that it's become co-opted, you know. And so this is something that I love. And so yeah, so I've just been trying to enter these spaces and be as um, you know, just as <laughs> I, I think one of my good friends said this to me the other day, which made me feel a lot better. She's like, you know, it's cool that you're, you're just basically entering these white spaces and you're just fucking things up. <laughs> so I, was like, I was like, thanks, man. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Yeah, but it, it can be difficult. So that's why I, I began the organization that I did, Jojo, which is a youth environmental organization, because I was like, man, it shouldn't just be me out there speaking on climate change. It shouldn't just be my voice being heard. I just want to populate the world with as many Marshallese voices just hitting you, just slapping people across the face like, climate change, Marshall Island, listen to us, you know? So I'm just like, so I, I definitely see that, I think maybe in other spaces there's a lot more um, representation and, you know, like black, I'm so inspired by like the Black Lives Matter movement and a lot of the organizing that's been going on in the States. So I, I'm hoping that maybe the environmental movement can be a little bit more inclusive and a little bit more aware of these kinds of... Uh, Isn't that true though, Zia? And like the disability justice community, we talk, you did a workshop this afternoon and I think, you know, you talked a lot about how really the dominant is a, a white space and how uh, people of color's experiences aren't necessarily represented in the well, like, I mean, every mainstream movement is white dominated, you know? I mean, like, pretty much that's what it is. You know, environmental movement, white people. You know, disability rights movement, white people. Which is why, you know, anything that has justice in it, you're like, okay, that's where the people of color are. But, all right. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I think, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I think that's why disability justice, like, like I was talking about in the workshop today, which is a newer term, was like founded by disabled black and brown people who were like, we can't just look at like disability stuff through a single issue lens. Like it's also about colonization, racism, like you know, like traumas that we've survived through surviving wars and invasions and stuff like that. You know, like disabilities that a lot of our folks get through like working in factories or like working surrounded by racism. That's a disability issue. You know, when there's like a bomb dropped on our homeland and then people get really sick, and, like radiation or other stuff. That's disability. You know, it's not just, you know, white people who are like, yes, I want to pass a law, but that's really important. It's also all the other intersectional stuff that we're dealing with. Actually, um, like what? Yeah, you're good. Why don't you get your thoughts on um, so the, the notion that no one is, uh, no one is disposable, no one is left in behind, and um, sort of the political climate we have in hand. What is your response? Have you been writing about this, responding to this? I know, I can't remember. It's in my notes here. I, I spilled coffee in my original notes, so. There's, there's something that says no one is left behind? Or is um, that like that bush, that child, no, no child left behind? No, no, not that, not that. <laughs> there's a bunch of shirts in the marshal. No, and also not like that rapture thing. You know, the Left Behind, you know those Left Behind movies where the rapture happens? Oh, yeah. We're not talking about that. <laughs> Maybe it's... We sh how do we respond to that? Oh, we sh how do we not make sure... Oh, how do we make sure people aren't left Yes. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, maybe you can also talk, I mean, you are working with youth. Um, how, what is that like and why, why is it important for youth to be involved in the movement? I see youth as like our most sustainable form of investment, I guess. Like, you know, they gotta be, you gotta, you can't talk about climate change and not talk to the youth because they're the ones that are inheriting the earth, you know, as we, as we know. So, yeah, I see that as an important aspect and I'm not entirely sure why. I guess I just always felt like the youth is someplace that I could work from because I still have, I'm not gonna be out there trying to teach elders how to do their work. So. <laughs> I'm going to get shut down real fast. Um, Leah, speaking of elders, um, you talked, uh, or we communicated a little bit about your relationship with your father, and um, you, I don't know if you were interested in reading, uh, you had said that you had a, a poem that you'd written about your father, um, and I think talking about sort of the bridging of the generations, uh, Apano, we really, we've been around for 20 years now, we have 
Uh, we had a lot of our founders um, involved in the program today, but we also have our ally youth, and uh, we're really trying to walk, work across generations, but there are a lot of challenges um, in working across generations. So maybe you could talk about your work and how you reflect about that. Sorry, I'm kind of a downer, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm going to read this poem and I'm going to be like, oh, I'm going to go cry now, and I'm like, sorry. Um, yeah, no, so I actually wrote this piece at the very last, so like we talked about, there was um, a community-sponsored gathering called the Asian Pacific Islander Spoken Word Poetry Summit every two years for like 12, 15 years, something like that, um, and this is written at the last one, which is in, or the next to last one. I forget. It was in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis, St. Paul in 2011, 2012. And um, there's a workshop on persona poems, which is when you write in the voice of somebody else. And everybody, you know, this all Asian room, we, when we went around, we all written in the voice of our parents. You know, so, you know, that's, that's what it is. And, um, you know, in terms of generational stuff, I mean, when you were asking that question about the youth and why it's important to work with youth, I mean, I'm 41 now, but like I just remember being like a 17-year-old activist and organizer, and I was like, yeah, like I don't really think of like I think of youth as youth, but I don't think of like younger people as like this other that you know needs to be trained. I mean, in my experience, like young people are the ones who know what's up and who are like really willing to like put themselves on the line, man. I like go, like we're not fucking around here. Like this is what we need to do, and. Um, I think that there's a lot to be learned to, to elders. I think people who are getting to this weird space called midlife that I guess I'm in, we're important too, I guess. I don't know, but like, you know, I just feel like younger people get disrespected a lot and don't get seen as legitimate activists, and that's bullshit. You we know? respect yeah. you, young yeah. yeah. people. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so this piece that I wrote, I'm just going to talk a little bit about it. I mean, it was about my relationship with my dad, who um, you know, as a queer person, like as a queer Sri Lankan, as a queer South Asian person, I think it's been really important to really, because you know, sometimes like as queer and trans folks, we get told, oh, you know, we don't have that kind of thing back home, you know, we brought you to this country and you went crazy, you know, and um, that's not, I mean, it's like, oh yeah, you know, you went, you got a pair of Nikes and you became gay, and it's like, no, it's not how it works, first of all, and um, I think it's really important to really, you know, for a lot of queer and trans folks of color, I know it's really important to assert that, like, our communities have always had queer and trans and two-spirit folks in them, like, we predate colonization, we were the leaders, you know, and then we come from somewhere, like, we're not an accident, we're not this, like, Western aberration, and we have so much smarts as activists. So, sorry, I'm doing that thing where I don't want to talk the poem to them that's, like, more talking the actual poem, but my father came out to me when he was drunk when I was 22, and then a lot of things made sense. Like, he had had this, like, best friend, who was a man named David, who was Trinidadian, who he'd lived with in London, because my dad was, like, one of the first generations of Sri Lankans to leave the island for 10 years, and then my dad lost his status. He had, he had British Commonwealth status, because he was born before independence, and he was told, okay, you either go back home to Lanka, instead of military service, or you figure something out, and he married my mom. I was like, great, okay, stabilization. And they have a complex relationship, but um, when I came out, when you know, he, I, you know, when we had that conversation, I was like, okay, I there's this line where we say like we are our ancestors' answered prayers, and I was like, right, like I think in a lot of ways each generation is what the previous generation wasn't able to do sometimes. So um, I'm gonna stand too. So this is called. My father, Christmas Day, 1991, as I come down the stairs in ripped jeans and that Jane's Addiction t-shirt with all the naked people on it. Which, if you're from the 90s, you may remember that shirt. This is in his voice. I'm tense. I want her to take off those ripped jeans, that obscene t-shirt, and put on something else. It's Christmas? This is not what I wanted for my life. This little red light woman I'm married to, this angular glaring daughter, one shade lighter than me, who hates me with her terrible green hair. I guess things come full circle. Um, <laughs> I want to drink. I want to be alone in the basement with my tumbler of Johnny Walker Red, the History Channel on low, something educational about Winston Churchill, some nice white man from the country that was the last place I felt happy, which was 20 years ago. The dull, humid cool of this beige factory outlet wall-to-wall -wall carpet, the old brown and orange nylon plaid couch, and a bar painted thick brown that no one uses but me. I don't want to be near my parents, either. 
I don't want to think about them or write back to those thin blue aerogram letters from Melbourne or pick up the phone when they call in the tiny window between our time zones and half a world away when we're both awake. I don't want to think about my desire, how I tell the neighbors I'm Portuguese sometimes to try and play it off, how far away I am from everything I knew. I lock it all in a box, my gender, my parents, every island I grew up on, to live in this vinyl siding house surrounded by people I hate, snow I hate, everything I hate but fear, TV, and silence. It's easy enough to put one foot in front of another through my days of paycheck and then no paycheck and fuming, twisting, barking orders at this wife who work, works three jobs when I can't find any and puts a line of pillows down the middle of the bed so we never touch. But I sleep in the basement so I can wake up to take the commuter rail to some place that's at least a city with coffee and men that I can look at on my lunch break. But there she comes, this angry brown daughter, who looks sort of like me except she despises me, for how I drive the car too fast, shot her down for all of her smart ass remarks. I don't know if she knows I learned how to drive the week before her mother gave birth to her. There were always trashaws, buses, and the London Underground where I grew up. I try to talk to her in my car, but she turns up the volume of her walk and so loud she can't even hear my voice. And I know one day soon, as soon as she's done getting through college, the way I couldn't, she's gonna go to another country, just like I did, with a big bag of clothes and a notebook, and not take my calls, not answer my letters. She'll go one step further and change her phone number, unlisted, change her name to something she says is both of ours. She found researching her senior thesis on Sri Lankan women, which I could have told her if she just asked. I think she'll like women or like tender, leaning men who I would have liked to like too. Like the one with his ringlets who shows up at the house with a hash brownie and roses for her. My daughter's gonna leave me here with this silence, Johnny Walker Red, the History Channel on low, the red like woman getting quieter and quieter. She's gonna write a letter saying things I never dared to say to my parents and close the door of the basement gently, firmly, in my face. Thanks. Um, I, since you both had a chance to read and I think have inspired uh, people here, I would love to hear you both talk about, um, for people um, in the audience and people who are aspiring artists and creatives, what you might have to say to them, and then also people who maybe don't aspire to that, how you can kind of uh, be involved or be engaged with cultural work, art work, creativity. By work. <laughs> By their work. Yeah, like yeah that's support that's their artists and their finances. Because I feel like a lot of times, um, you know, as artists, you, you get the whole like, this is great for experience. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna, it's gonna be great for you know publicity. So I would say, yeah, support your artists. You know, actually support and honor the work that goes into their craft because it is hard. It is hard to write a good piece of poem, you know, a good poem, a single poem is so much work. So I would say that one, but then also just to, as far as art goes, if you want to do art, just do it. I don't know, maybe that's a little too simple, huh? Maybe you have more. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I just would say, like, I think when you think about, I mean, everyone's different, but I think that for a lot of people who think about doing writing or art or performance, you know, we don't, I would just say like find your role models and like especially find your role models as like APIA artists because we're out here and you know, Google is your friend, archives are your friend, your community is your friend. Um, and especially because like, I think, I mean, I know growing up I was like, how do people become writers? Like, do you just get like, dinged, you know, by a magic wand and all of a sudden you have a book deal? Like, how does that work? And like, there's a lot of really concrete steps to being a working artist um, that people can teach you. Um, I think really just knowing that like people out there are waiting for your work and your work needs to be out there. Like people are gonna have their lives saved by the work and then there's stuff that only you can tell. And I really believe that if you have that drop that inclination, that desire, like you actually kind of have a responsibility to do it. That like our people really need the stories told and you can figure out the ways that work for you to tell them. Um, 
Yeah, and like, don't let people give you any of this, like, Asians don't do art bullshit, because I'm sorry, go to the museum, what do you think that is? Like, all those, like, you know, APIA, like, you know, all the stuff that's there, the writing, the poetry, the art, you know, half of the Bible, that's Asian art, okay? So, you know, it's pretty popular, you can do it too. Um, yeah, I just, like, I mean, I think that, you know, I think that as API folks, like, we're either invisible or hyper-visible, depending on the day, you know? Like, um, so one thing that happens is it's actually, there are a lot of histories of Asian and Pacific Islander folks doing community-based art and supporting each other, so find those, and just know that if you feel like there's not an audience, you can just start collective and create it. Like, it's not hard. And, you know, just treat each other well, don't fight over money, you know, be nice, things like that are really important. And um, yeah, as for folks, I mean, I would echo what, what Kathy was saying. I think that in terms of uh, folks who are not creative, I think just like taking it seriously that cultural work is work, you know, that it's not this little doily on the edge of the plate, it's, it's the food, you know? And really seeing cultural workers as workers and figuring out ways to like pay us for our time, support us, see us as people who are contributing, stuff like that. Um, I don't know, I think, one thing I didn't say is like I was pretty shitty as just like a standard activist. Like I tried to do the 17 meetings a week thing and I just got really tired. <laughs> who knows? Like, who knows why that was? And um, you know, and I think that there's still a lot of you know role modeling out there that's like real activists are the ones in the streets, you know. And first of all, a lot of people can't be in the streets if you're disabled or you have kids or you're older or all kinds of stuff, depending. And also, like, I think that, you know, our poetry, our artwork, our culture is what makes people believe that change can happen and, you know, really have the feelings part of all the work. So just, like, seeing that as legit. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I would add, like, you know, especially with um, in climate change, like, there is so much statistics, it's so much science, it's so much facts, and a lot of times some of these issues, social justice issues, it gets boiled down to different laws, different, you know, uh, academia terms, and... Poetry and art brings the humanity back into focus, and so I, I would, yeah, I would say that. And also, finding mentors, that's another thing I would add. Yeah, and, you know, if you're here in this room or here in uh, Portland and Oregon, Apano does have an arts and media project that's the artists and the creatives in our community, so we, we are a resource, we can connect you with these folks and other folks. Um, um, and maybe to close out tonight, um, if you have any last thoughts you want to share, but also share with us how we can find your work, what you have coming on, coming up. That would be awesome. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, I have a book coming. I tell us about I, your I, book. I, I think I said that. But yeah, I, it's, tell us uh, what, it's called The Jell Book, book um, Poems from a Marshallese Daughter. And it's getting published by University of Arizona Press uh, Suntrack series, which publishes indigenous authors. And um, this is their first time, second time publishing a Pacific Islander author. And besides that, um, I'm playing with the idea of moving into writing plays and possibly creating a, a play on climate change that could be performed in the Marshall Islands. Um, and then what else is, yeah, the back back here. So yeah, if you need to find me, I have my website, uh, www.mindy.com. And that's where I post my writings and just kind of free writes and thoughts throughout you know, my process of understanding you know, the world around me. Yeah, um, so I had this book, which is my last book of poetry, Body Map, come out last year, and it's on Bowenzi House Press, which is really long-standing, like, small um, African and South Asian press in Toronto, which you can get. And um, my memoir that I worked on for 10 years, Dirty River, uh, Queer Femme of Color, Dreaming Her Way Home, came out last year also. I'm real tired. Um, <laughs> no. and, and you can, like, order those anywhere online or bookstores or wherever. And, um, I'm doing a little bit of touring, I'm mostly trying to stay close to home, but you can look at my website, which is brownstarworld.org. Um, I teach writing classes online, I also travel and perform a lot, I'm based in Seattle right now, which is cool. And um, Sins and Ballad, which is the Disability Justice Performance Collective I'm a part of, we're actually having a really big show in two weeks in San Francisco. Yeah, um, which is really dope, and so if you're in the Bay, check it out, it's October 14th, 15th, 16th at ODC Theater in San Francisco, and we're also going to be filming it and broadcasting the film afterwards for folks who can't physically make it there. Yeah. Thank you both for being here and for coming out to Apano this night. Thank you. Oh, can we give a hand to our <laughs>